The Lord be with you. Grace and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are delighted that you have decided to join us this morning to study God's Word together. I invite you to sit back, relax, take in a deep breath. And please join me in prayer. Holy God, your word is a lamp to our feet. So open our hearts and minds through the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is a collection of verses from Exodus chapter 16. Listen for the word of the Lord. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elim, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the, this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The house of Israel called it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, in order that they may see the food with which I fed you in the wilderness, when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar, and put an omer of manna in it, and place it before the Lord, and keep it throughout your, all of your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the covenant for safekeeping. The Israelites ate manna forty years until they came to a habitable land. They ate manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. This is the word of the Lord. Have you ever opened up your fridge or pantry and stared at the contents inside and thought to yourself, who bought this stuff? Now, I don't mean who else in your family may have been responsible for those purchases. I mean those times when you know that you were the one who brought those things home. You're just not sure which version of you was responsible. Maybe you're staring at that lonely, neglected bag of kale and thinking to yourself, who was that guy who bought that kale? What dreams did he have for his life? And how did kale fit into them? Or maybe it's that carton of ice cream staring at you from the freezer, and you think to yourself, man, what was I going through that day that compelled me to bring this stuff home? And maybe you're just having a bad day, a particularly stressful one. Or maybe you made the classic mistake of going to the grocery store while hungry. Hunger has a special power in our lives. It has the power to convince us to make impulsive decisions, 
to pick up that sweet or salty treat, the one that we know will give us a quick jolt of energy or temporary relief, but we're gonna have to pay for in one way or another down the road. Hunger can also change our moods, often dramatically, turning us into ill-tempered, impatient creatures, the so-called experience of being hangry. And that's just our normal in-between meals type of hunger. There are, of course, more serious types of hunger. Hunger created through food scarcity. Now that's the type of hunger that most of us have not experienced firsthand. For most of us, hunger is just a temporary inconvenience. But for many people throughout history, and for many people in the world today, hunger is more of an existential crisis and a daily reality. That's the kind of hunger that the Bible takes very seriously. In fact, there are many stories in the Bible about hunger created through food scarcity. Food scarcity created either through natural disasters like famines or through corrupt and greedy human practices. And often in the Bible, these experiences of food scarcity create crises of faith. Scripture reveals to us that God takes these crises of faith very seriously. Our scripture lesson this morning from the book of Exodus is this kind of story. The people of God have just been liberated from bondage in Egypt, and they are about a month and a half into their new life of freedom in the wild wilderness. Now, this wilderness setting is very important. The wilderness functions as a kind of state of limbo. It's a space that marks the end of one way of life and the beginning of another. It's an in-between space, a space of uncertainty, of temptation, of conflict, and of hunger. Now, as they make their way through this wilderness on the way to the Promised Land, the people often grow irritable, impatient, angry, cranky. In fact, this is just one of several so-called grumbling stories, stories in which the people lash out at God or Moses for one reason or another. Now, the root cause of their grumbling in this story is hunger. The people are afraid that they are going to starve to death out in this desert wilderness. And in their fear, they say something astonishing. They say, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Now, this is far more serious than just hangry whining. You see, the people are lashing out at Moses, their human leader, but what they're really doing is leveling a very serious accusation against God. They are effectively saying, why did you bring us all the way out here? If you wanted to kill us, you could have just done it back in Egypt. You know, things weren't exactly great back there, but at least we didn't have to worry about food. In fact, I'm starting to think that it'd be better to be beaten to death than to starve to death. And you know, maybe things weren't so bad back there. Maybe we blew things out of proportion and we had it better than we realized. Maybe we made a bigger mistake following you out to this desert. I think this story offers us some important warnings about how our memories can be distorted and twisted when we are stressed out, anxious, or irritated. It's a story about the tenacious temptation of the familiar, about going back to what is known, to what is familiar, even if we know that what is familiar is not very good for us, that it's unhealthy and possibly toxic. Have you ever had a friend who was in a really bad relationship and they would complain to you about it all the time? And maybe one day that friend got out of that relationship and you were so happy for them and proud of them and maybe more than a little relieved for yourself because you wouldn't have to listen to that relationship drama anymore. But then maybe one day that friend calls you and said, so and so and I are talking again. I think we're gonna get back together and I know what you're thinking, but there really was more good stuff than you realize. And I'm hopeful that this time things will be different. Maybe you sat there screaming internally, thinking, please don't do it, please. Our memories can be tricky, unreliable things. They don't really give us objective facts. They give us kind of a muddled mess of images and emotions. They are less like perfectly sculpted, unchanging statues and more like Play-Doh. That can be contorted and distorted and that can be messy, pick up all sorts of dirt and grime. When we're anxious or afraid or whatever, we can distort our memories. And sometimes the end result is a dangerous kind of nostalgia for something that never actually existed. So 
Maybe it is a distorted memory of a relationship that in truth was not actually all that healthy. Or maybe it's a distorted memory of your family, an idyllic version of your family that doesn't actually match up to the experiences you had together. That may be repressing all sorts of difficult things you endured, all sorts of trauma or unpleasantness. Or maybe it's a distorted view of history in general, one that does not take into account the harsh and difficult experiences of people who may look and think differently than ourselves. Individuals can certainly be guilty of this kind of nostalgia, but so can families, and so can entire nations, and so can churches, especially mainline Protestant denominations that are still lamenting the loss of the glory days. You know those days, back when the pews were full, we baptized babies every week, and no one ever disagreed about anything. It's a myth, of course, and we know it's a myth, but it's a surprisingly tenacious one. And I would argue that it's also a particularly dangerous one. It's dangerous because it holds us back from being able to learn the lessons that we really need to learn about what we actually experienced in our history. When we tend to pretend that everything was perfect and fine and dandy in a mythical past, we rob ourselves of the opportunity of drawing strength and hope from those memories of true resilience, of those times when we got through periods that were difficult and uncertain, just like the period we're in right now. That kind of nostalgia is dangerous because it holds us back drawing strength from those memories of those times when God's grace was there for us, when we were lost and grieving and afraid. It robs us of the opportunity of knowing that we've been through periods of difficulty before and we got through them through God's good love and grace. And we will get through this one as well. In their fear and frustration and hunger, the people begin to lash out, and they begin to distort their memories of Egypt. They begin to think, hey, maybe things weren't so bad back there. Now, God takes this development very seriously. And he intervenes immediately and offers the people the gift of the bread from heaven, of manna. He also gives them a bunch of dead quail, but the text doesn't really go into detail about that. Which is probably a good thing. It sounds kind of gross. Anyways. God makes it clear to Moses and Aaron that the manna is not just a gift of food. It's not just something to silence the whiny voices of these hangry people. He says that it's also meant to function as a test. And to this end, he offers up some specific instructions for how the manna is to be handled. First, the people are supposed to get up every single day and go out and gather just as much as they need to feed their families for the day. No more, no less. God has promised that it would be there each and every day, so there's no reason to hoard more just in case. You will have exactly as much as you need. God will make sure of that. And as a fail-safe to make sure that people don't try to grab more than they actually need, God makes it so that the mana will rot if you try to keep it overnight. It will rot and attract worms. Now, the only exception to this rule would be on the sixth day. On the sixth day, you could gather a little extra and go home and cook even more. That way, on the next day, on the Sabbath, you could sit back and relax. You wouldn't have to go out and work. You could just sit, relax and enjoy your meal and enjoy the gift of this life and a relationship with a God who loves you and provides for you. You see, the mana was not just about filling the bellies of these hungry people. It was about giving them a new rhythm and structure to their lives. In this limbo space in the wilderness, in this space between the life of slavery and the life of the covenant that they would receive at Sinai, the people needed a glimpse of a new way of life. A way of life that was characterized by good work on a daily basis. A way of life that was characterized by a focus on the Sabbath that was oriented towards the joy of being part of this creation. And the joy of being in relationship with the God who provides for us when we are in need. There's one last part of this story that often gets overlooked. One last piece of instruction that God gives to Moses and Aaron. At the end of chapter 16, God tells Moses and Aaron to take a daily portion of manna and to put it in a jar. And that jar will be passed down from generation to generation as a constant visual reminder of the ways that God provided for the people during their wilderness journey. And that jar would serve to give the people hope when they were making their own difficult transitions out of a life of slavery and into a life of freedom. You see, I think God recognized during that moment when the people's memories of Egypt began to become distorted, God recognized that the people needed new memories. New memories to shape and sustain their new identity as liberated people. 
And by all accounts, the jar seems to have done its job. This is a story that is referenced all throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New. We hear echoes of it in the journey of Jesus through the wilderness for 40 days. This story of the manna being provided in the wilderness is one of the most cherished stories of the people of God, and it has been for thousands of years. But it is so important for us to recognize that this is not a story about an idyllic past. This is not a story about the glory days, when everything was perfect, everything ran smoothly, smoothly, decisions were easy, and everyone got along and behaved themselves. This is not a story about the people behaving themselves. If anything, this is a story about the people at their worst, at their grumpiest and angriest. But it's also a story about how God was with them all the same. God was with them and for them. Those are the kinds of stories we need to hear right now. Not the stories about how everything was perfect in the past, but the stories about how things were difficult then too, but we got through it all the same. And we got through it because God was always there for us. Many of us have been members of the church for a long, long time. And maybe we can remember the glory days. And maybe if we're honest enough, we can admit that they weren't always so glorious. Sometimes it was difficult. Sometimes it was painful. But God got us through those times all the same. So let's share those stories with each other. Not the stories about how things were perfect back then, but the stories about the times when it was tough and God got us through them all the same. So those are the stories that help us to find our resilience in our own wilderness journey. We really need to be able to draw strength from memories of the ways that God's grace has sustained us in the past. Because the truth, my friends, whether we like it or not, is that this wilderness we're in right now is not yet done with us. Some experts are currently estimating that it's going to take another three to four years for the church to fully understand how the past year and a half of turmoil has affected it. We have a lot of wilderness journeying yet before us. Times of uncertainty, Times of irritation and times of hunger. And in those times, we need to be able to sustain ourselves with the memories of God's grace stretching through the ages. But it's important for us to also recognize that we need to be forging new memories. New memories of how God is providing for us here and now. Do you know where the name mana comes from? According to the text, when the people first encountered this strange substance, they picked it up and said, mana who? Which meant what is it? That's where the name mana comes from. It was a previously unexperienced new form of grace and nourishment. And friends, God is continuing to rain mana down upon us here today. Think about the ways that we are now able to worship together in a digital space. Yeah, that might not be new to everybody, but it was new to us, trust me. We also have Zoom Bible studies and all sorts of other ways that we are able to connect with each other and maintain our bonds of fellowship and continue to worship and encounter God together. We need to be aware of those things, to actively search for signs of that grace in the world today, because the truth is that we have an obligation right now to begin to forge new memories, new memories of how God's grace is getting us through this wilderness we're in right now. Because one day, future generations will look back upon us, and they will ask us how we got through it, and they will ask us how God got us through it. And we will be able to say to them, you know what? It was hard. It was really hard. And we were not always on our best behavior. But God never abandoned us. And that same God will never abandon you. Amen.